discuss about occlusion. So let me just put my presentations up. Okay. So let's see. Okay, perfect. So can you see the screens? Yeah, yeah we can see it. Uh, okay, excellent. So today um, we're going to discuss about occlusion, but mainly application of occlusion in general dental practice, because occlusion is such a wide topic. We can't obviously cover everything in one hour, but I hope to be back at some point, hopefully, uh, if you guys enjoy this. Um, today we're going to discuss about sort of understand why occlusion is important in general dental practice, because there are more general dental practitioners than specialists. And I don't think occlusion is limited to specialists or is limited to elite dentists. That's what many people think. Um, but I think it's more relevant to general dental practitioners than, you know, elite patient uh, dentists, because, you know, you guys see the most number of patients. Dave. Can I just yeah. quickly uh, stop you there? There's some kind of a disturbance in the voice. Uh, would you? Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Let me just try and use my. Um, is that clearer? No, there's still a bit of a disturbance. If you if you go on to the speaker setting mode and see what setting you're on. Is that not clearer? Yeah, th there is some kind of a drag afterwards. Okay. Um, uh, I think uh, now we are able to hear now, uh, Devang. Is that, right okay. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah that's, fine. that's good. Okay, excellent. So um, what we are going to do is discuss uh, important terminologies associated with occlusion. And uh, you'll have to forgive me uh, if you know these already. I'm just uh, assuming that uh, you know some of it some people may not know so i'm going to go from the really basic uh, and and uh, bring the knowledge up first so most of most of you guys would know these terminologies uh, and then we'll discuss the application of occlusion in uh, some of the clinical scenarios and i'll have some i have some cases which we can discuss with you guys um, and then obviously if you have any questions please ask uh, whenever it comes and um, i'll do my best to answer them so before I start learning anything, I ask myself a question, you know, why should I bother investing my time, money, and energy learning anything? Because right now we are in an era where it's a knowledge overload. You know, everyone's giving so much knowledge, so much information, and you, are, you have to be selective at what you choose to learn, what you choose your uh, time, and when you choose your time to sort of spend on learning anything. So first thing, what occlusion uh, helps you is that it avoids patients coming back again and again for those tiny adjustments or patients not getting used to it, the bite. Um, and in this situation where you know, we are post-COVID, seeing one patient is probably two to three times more expensive than what was pre-COVID time and uh, any of your employers, or if you are a practice owner, you would know this. So reducing that patient appointments uh, is very, very important in, in trying to do everything in one go. It reduces your failures, again, uh, because of that, it reduces appointments or time and improves the success rate. Obviously, if patients not having any issues, they are a happy patient. You can predict future issues. So if you are checking occlusion, uh, regularly, you can see that there is a non-working side contact. If it's an unnatural tooth, that's fine. But if that's the tooth you are restoring it, uh, then you don't want to really replicate that non-working side contact. But if that non-working side contact on an existing tooth, which is heavily filled, then you may want to educate patient that you know this may break at some point, and you might end up needing either drastic treatment like extraction or a crown a much more uh, intense uh, destructive treatment um, the knowledge of occlusal splints are very very uh, helpful especially if it's non-agp 
Um, everything's about non-AGP right now. Um, you know, the less AGP you create, better it is because I was uh, talking to Jay and I was saying that, you know, my nose hurts more uh, than my back nowadays while wearing uh, FFP3 masks, some of them. Um, more complex cases. So while we are on a stabilization phase, we can give patient occlusal splints. However, I feel that now this two, three months has gone, you will see more and more uh, complex cases. And I've already noticed that the patients are more keen in doing treatment. I thought it would be otherwise. But at least my patients are more keen on moving forward because they have now um, seen what the dentition teeth can do and they have been in trouble and you know they are, the pain is the motivating factor when you are um, doing anything really. So if you have a knowledge of occlusion, you will be able to treat a, a more complex cases than just a single restoration. So if you look at some of the scenario, which you probably would have come across in your career that you know you have had this old amalgam which is stitched out, you remove the amalgam and you try and do a composite, really nice anatomy, really nice looking tooth, and then you check occlusion and patient bites and you, you know you have to keep drilling, keep drilling, keep drilling, and your, your, your composite is dished out. Or you are preparing seven, you know, per seven for indirect restoration, and you are you know for sure that you created two millimeter depth guides occlusally, and you've done good two millimeter occlusal reduction at least. And when patient closes, uh, only 0.5 millimeter reduction you can see. What happened there? Most likely, the patient's jaw has seated back from its more um, posterior, superior, or anterior superior, the way you look at it, uh, position, more relaxed position, more closer to CR, and that's why you reduce that space. And knowing occlusion or factor uh, how it affects, you will be able to hopefully try and mitigate that. Or at least you will be able to predict that or you probably would have treated a patient where you fixed one tooth and then patient comes back in a few months time, breaks another tooth, breaks another tooth, breaks another tooth. They think, oh, this tooth was, you know, heavily filled and that's why it broke. But if you look at occlusion carefully, you would actually many times be able to predict which tooth will break next and hopefully before it breaks, you'll be able to treat it. Or simply, you, if you want to, you know, offer more a predictable comprehensive treatment, then you need uh, knowledge of occlusion. So it's not just a um, fancy term. And you know, many people think that because to be honest, we can get away without you know doing too much learning about occlusion because patient's jaw is quite adaptable. And as far as you're doing simple single tooth restorations, most of the time we can get away. Um, however, it when you are doing more complex treatment or multiple restorations, that's when your occlusion, knowledge of occlusion is, it becomes really uh, important. So let's look at this tooth carefully. So this patient came to me obviously with the vertical fracture. And if I ask you to look at this tooth, you would say, you know, quite obvious things. You have, uh, the patient has you know, horizontal fracture line, a uh, vertical crack. Um, heavy faceting on the palatal cusp, which is not unusual because it's a, it's a functional cusp. You do have some crack line on buccal aspect. Now, again, it's not unusual when you have um, amalgam. Uh, in my experience, if it's a large or a uh, small amalgam, all the time you can see this crack developing. However, if you carefully look at the means your buccal cusp, you will be able to see the faceting. And Looking at the faceting on a non-working side, uh, non-working or, or the non-functional cusp, um, you need to really ask question why the faceting is there and you need to really assess the occlusion because that could be non-working side contact and patient might be um, biting on there and might have fractured that too. Or even if it's a working side contact, having a guidance from seven is uh, quite detrimental and we will see uh, in, uh, ahead of it. 
uh, in, in further when we progress in lecture. The, the other thing which you, I would like you to notice is six. So if you look at the six, exact same cusp is broken in that six. Now, you know, it's, is it, a, is it a, you know, coincidence? Um, probably, it's very difficult to know because when patient came to me, patient already had this uh, filling in, 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 in that tooth. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if six and sevens are guiding teeth um, and maybe with amalgam and, and you know, that was the nail in the coffin. And obviously the tooth was uh, had to be removed. Um, knowing occlusion will be able to help you in planning cases like this. Very, very simple, straightforward case. But I get dentists, you know, coming to me and say, oh, you know, I do minor incisor the repair and they keep breaking. And you will be able to differentiate between this case in that case, uh, when you're doing upper left two uh, in the bottom case, uh, you will be able to differentiate what you need to assess and why these two cases are different. Although almost identical, once we remove the filling, uh, almost identical defect uh, we're going to fill. Uh, again, these two cases we'll discuss later on in the webinar. Or um, this patient, you know, uh, this patient came to me for fractured upper left two. Uh, he was in a mid-treatment with one of the dentists who was restoring uh, both centrals and upper left two. What happened was um, the tooth upper left two was prepared for a crown because it had a chip and then the tooth broke. So the dentist put a post in there and then post broke along with the crown in a temporization phase. So it all happened within a very short period of time. The chip, according to patient, was there for a long time, and it wasn't bothering uh, him. But you know, he thought he wanted to do some cosmetic dentistry, and that's why he came there. Again, this case we'll discuss in detail um, at the end, and I'll show you what uh, I think was the case and how I managed to restore it. So now I hope you understand, and I'm sure you're here because you know the importance of occlusion. So why it's so confusing, you know, um, many times it's, it's an illusion that, you know, many dentists are kind of scared of learning about occlusion or they think it's, it's just too much or just send the uh, patients to some of the dentist who knows occlusion. So to start with, there's a recent study done in uh, 2019, uh, done in 2018, published 2019, uh, where they checked in curriculum of different universities and they you know, send a questionnaire. And what they found is a, a vast irregularity. Some of the universities didn't teach occlusion as a separate entity. They used to teach occlusion within some of the other um, elements of their teaching. Uh, one of the university spent only six hours uh, in teaching of occlusion. Some of the universities were really good, but it's, a, it's this various uh, varied knowledge which we're getting as an undergraduate now. Uh, certainly when I was undergraduate, um, I was told, uh, I wasn't taught occlusion very well, and I was told, you know, patient bites, tap, tap, tap. Uh, when you see blue mark on your filling, you just reduce it until you don't see any blue marking, you know, and that's, that's, that's occlusion. Hopefully by end of this webinar, you will see so that's not the case. Um, the other question, reason is that too much information available that seems very difficult to relate to. You know, there are um, so many terminologies uh, related to occlusion which you can't really see practically happening. Even the, the very fundamental terminology which is centric relation which we'll go through in, in later on. But when you are treating patient you cannot tell 100% whether you have reached or you have located that centric relation position. You have tools to assess it but you cannot 100% be sure that that is the center relation of that patient because you, know, you, you have to do some sort of MRI in that position um, or dissect patient and, and, and really assess it. So you know, there are terms and there are things, but it all seems very theoretical. Obviously, there, there, there are a lot of different opinions um, related to occlusion and everyone has their own opinion. 
so do I. So what you need to learn from this webinar is, you know, some things what you learn here, you will be able to implement. Some things you learn some, from some other teacher, you might be able to implement. So be open to uh, all um, suggestions because it is more like an art than really a science because uh, we haven't been able to prove it, uh, much of the theories. There are a lot of different terminologies uh, in related to same thing. So in 2000, year 2000, if you look at the uh, glossary of prosthodontic terms, where they define all the prosthodontic terms, the definition of CO, which is centric occlusion, was the same as ICP. Now, in 2019, the definition has changed. So now, if you're talking to someone who graduated before 2000, and you both are talking about CO, the, their understanding of CO might be different than your understanding of CO. So, you know, you might be clashing, but you might be talking the same thing. Uh, as we discussed, there is no real scientific evidence in a lot of things we do in occlusion. Um, and conformity dentistry works most of the time, you know, you just take the filling out and, you know, do the one filling at a time or even three, four fillings at a time. And that works uh, partly because you're not drastically changing occlusion. You are probably changing occlusion, but very, very gradually. And, but mainly patients adaptability. And, you know, over 90% of patients are very good at adapting things, but you do find now and then where a patient comes to you and you know keep telling you that you know, things are different and you're not getting used to with the, with, the, with the new bite, although you think that you haven't changed that bite. But by changing this first point of contact, even ever so slightly, there will be a huge shift in the bite. And, and obviously you do need a lot of practice. You can't, it's not just one course. I mean, I run course six days, a uh, course on uh, occlusion, uh, occlusion masterclass, which I call it occl uh, occlusion to oral rehabilitation. And, you know, it, it takes six days to just learn different things. However, it takes years to practice everything. Um, so the way I look at the courses whenever I do courses is that I'm learning a concept, but it will be then depending on you to then implement into your practice, although you have hands-on elements. Uh, you do constantly need some reinforcing. And that's why I'm planning to do some ongoing education after my master's class so then you know, the dentist can be supported after their journey. Um, so when you're looking at occlusion, it's not just teeth. So you have obviously teeth, you have periodontal ligament, you have gums, you have muscles, TMJ, and then you have neuromusculature, so you have neurons working alongside. So everything is an occlusion team. So when you're looking at, you know, when you're considering occlusion, you must consider, you know, that you, you need, you're looking at teeth, TMJ, muscles, everything together. Um, and just for simplifying this lecture or webinar, we, I'm going to just concentrate on the teeth but don't forget that there are muscles, there are you know, nerves involved in there, the parental ligaments, and, and you know, the, this TMJ joint. Uh, for purpose of this webinar, I'm assuming that the TMJ of the patients we are talking, TMJ and you know, the patient doesn't have any muscle spasm, and that that TMJ is fine. So let's uh, look at the terminologies related to occlusion. So the first one is very, we are very familiar with, which is intercuspal position or maximum intercuspal position. And which is basically when you ask patient to bite, tap, 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 patient closes together in a comfortable position and their teeth are in a, in a, in a maximum contact. This is simple. This is, we are used to checking, you know, when we ask patient to close their teeth. Then you have a centric occlusion, which is, which also used to call a uh, retruded contact position. And, and uh, many times people who follow nephrology, they call, use this term, uh, mainly in UK really, um, but it, it's the same thing. So centric occlusion is when you, your patient is, uh, their, their mandible is moving in the hinge axis freely, and when they close their jaw, there is usually first point of contact. 
um, uh, we will see in, a, in, in, in some, you know, in a later webinar that there are only five to 10% of patients who don't have any slide between their first point of contact to their maximum intercuspation. So when the patient contacts, uh, close their mouth or their teeth, they contact one tooth first, and then their muscle helps the jaw slide into more uh, maximum intercuspation position where um, you are, uh, all the teeth are contacting better uh, and mismatching. But the first point of contact is called centric occlusion. And centric relation is basically when teeth are not in contact and jaw is moving very freely in their hinge axis. So, you know, th there is no movement of the mandible. And if you think about uh, when you open your jaw and closing, when the teeth are not contacting, but when the condyle is completely just in a rotation um, mode, and if the muscles are relaxed at that time, it's in centric relation. Now, it could be anything between zero to 25 millimeter while patients are opening and closing. But if you have some derangement in TMJ, then it can change. But that's the three main terms. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the progressive slide shift and you know, trapodization and everything. Just to keep it simple, these are the three main terms you really need to familiarize yourself with. And you need to make sure that you understand these three terms very well. Um, so why centric relation is important? And you would hear this a lo lot of time that you, know, you need to look at patient CR. One of the reason is that it's a teeth apart position. So teeth are not really impacting on this position. It doesn't change over the time. So if you're changing the whole occlusion, if you're reorganizing, this is the good position to start with because you know that you will be able to reproduce in that particular patient, same position again and again. You may not be able to tell that that's a true CR, unless you do um, you know, kinematic face bow and you are putting some tattoos on patient's jaw and then checking properly, um, which even I don't do that often. But you won't be able to tell. But the, the idea is to get a, a reproducible position, which you can then go back to every time. Because when you're doing reorganized approach, you're changing the whole occlusion of patients. Um, again, when you're doing reorganized, you cannot really work with maximum intercuspation or ICP because as soon as you start reducing the teeth or changing the fillings, patient tends to lose of that intercuspal position. And that's why you need to know about um, CR. The other reason you need to know, you need to learn to put patient in CR is that, as I said before, that when you're treating that sevens, because most of the time, centric occlusion, which is, uh, as we discussed before uh, here, um, it's first point of contact, and this is in CR. So if you manage to get patient into nice, comfortable position where their jaw is not stressed and close, and if patient's contacting uh, on, let's say, upper right seven, and that's uh, on, on the buccal uh, incline of palatal cusp, and if you're reducing that cusp, patient loses that CO. And what happens is the patient jaw moves back. Now, um, and that's what it's called CO to um, ICP slide. So usually when patient closes in CO and they move on to ICP, that slide is called CO to ICP slide. Now, you observe that, as I said, between five to 10% of the cases, and the slide, the distance they slide forward is anything between 1.25 plus or minus two millimeter. Some of patient can be over two to four millimeter. Now those are the patients we really need to um, consider looking into more detail before do any restorative, even single crown on any posterior teeth. Because what will happen is if you remove that first point of contact, which is helping them move their jaw forward let's say three to four millimeter anteriorly, so then they can close properly. If you remove that contact, the jaw will not move forward, so it will stay back, and you might create anterior open bite. 
by just doing one two and that's why it's important to learn and to start getting practice um you know making patient look going into cr and once you practice that it doesn't take that long and if you cannot predictably get the patient back to cr and if you're doing something complex treatment um you need to stop and you need to probably give patient michigan splint to make all the muscles relax so this is just a diagram showing you um the slide between co to icp and hope oh, this video starts yeah perfect. you can see here a patient okay. is one of the dentists uh, are delicate to force. and you can see from the side very well now this is co okay. and now when patient closes or dentist you see this jaw sliding forward now if you're treating the tooth which was sliding this jaw forward the jaw won't slide forward and the bite will change by treating just one tooth so any questions uh so, uh, yeah that's very interesting because in this scenario how would you mitigate so you identify the slide but that mm -hmm. tooth needs treatment how would you minimize uh, how, how would you approach the case yeah, so uh, it's a very good question. So um, I'm not covering that in this webinar because it is a, a big uh, question. However, I'll tell you what you can do. Uh, there are three main things you can do. You can either ideally uh, can do ortho first to change the position of the teeth uh, so that you, have, uh, you haven't reduced the tooth and lost the slide, but you have changed the position of the tooth and lost the slide. Um, and move the front teeth by ortho into normal position. So now you've got better occlusion. And that would be the ideal way. Once the occlusion is better, then you can treat that tooth with the final restoration. So ortho is, is uh, really good, but it is tricky when you're in general dental practice. You know, you're telling patient that, you know, they need a crown on upper right seven, go to orthodontist, I'll see you in two years. So, um, but it is, it is uh, an ideal option. That's how you need to. That's how you can do it. The other way, uh, you can uh, try a technique uh, described by Mike Weiss, where you carefully prepare all the tooth without touching the first point of contact. Um, take the impression, ask technician to replicate that in your new crown. When crown comes, uh, you basically um, remove that first point of contact and fit the crown at the same time. By that, doing that technically, you will be able to maintain the slide. So now the slide is on your crown, which is not really my favorite technique because you know, uh, patient's teeth are really just uh, um, sort of a destructive, you know, especially teeth which slides, uh, you know, because that tooth will have really high load. But that's another technique. The other, the other thing you can do is, which fits very well into general dental practice, is that you really need to first assess whenever you're doing posterior teeth, whether that tooth has a first point of contact or not. By, by now, I'm hoping that you have assessed it and now you know that that's first point of contact. Then you need to assess the slide. Now, if you look at that uh, video and, you know, the slide, um, let me see if I can go back. Okay, I'm just running it again. But if you look at the slide, it's more vertical than horizontal. So when patient's closing, patient's moving more upwards uh, than more horizontal. And what happens is when you have this kind of uh, slide, it's in favor of you. So what will happen is the jaw will go upwards, which means patient will not lose their anterior guidance, but the jaw will go upwards. So all you will lose is your reduction which means you do more reduction okay so so you assess and uh, the, the the bite and then you have to do more reduction to give your technician a nice uh, final new crown sure. now, if you even don't have that then uh, as i said you have to go back to the ortho route where you might have to intrude or extrude some of the teeth and then do the ortho i hope that answers yeah Thank you.
Perfect. Um, so, so the types of uh, dis uh, occlusion by disclusions, which means you know what type of occlusion we have in, uh, patients have in their fatigue. Um, so one of them is bilateral balance occlusion. We know that uh, very well, but when we do denture setups, uh, we create this kind of occlusion. The other occlusion is unilateral balance occlusion, which is mainly group function. And when I say group function, I'm talking about usually canine premolar only, or probably mesial buccal cusp or first molar, but not going behind that. Because again, you will see as the webinar progress, uh, the more uh, posterior you go with guidance, the force is much, much more uh, destru uh, destructive. So disclusion uh, achieved via canine guidance, which is my favorite because I'm biased. Um, you know, there are uh, dentists who just would do group function. Um, the reason I do canine guidance, again, I'll discuss later on the webinar. The, the reason you need to understand the disclusion very well is because Many times we think that, you know, occlusion is important during function. However, occlusion is more important during parafunction because of these reasons. So if you look at the duration of teeth contact, it's four to 10 minutes a day. Now it's increased to two because the new 20. So the newer study shows that um, when you are chewing food, you get a delayed grinding phase. And sometimes you can have a tooth contact during chewing because before we just thought that yeah, when you have a bolus of food in your mouth, you don't have uh, that tooth to tooth contact. But now we know it depends on the type of food you're eating. So you may still have, however, the forces are very minimal. So it's still relevant that during function, you're not really contacting. Mainly you're contacting when you're swallowing. And when you're swallowing, you are not really. Um, placing that kind of a detrimental forces on the tooth. However, if you pair functioning, it's different. It could be up to four hours, four hours of heavy grinding. Uh, as you can see in the, the next uh, uh, column there, you know, you say the magnitude of applied force is almost 10 times more than what your patient can bite during the daytime. So if you ask a patient to bite quite close, you know, and this is very good, um, you know, educational tool for your patients. So I ask usually to my patients, you know, can you close your teeth really tight? And they do that. And I ask them to imagine 10 times higher forces you're applying at nighttime. And that's where you're grinding your teeth. Never ask uh, one of the tip of communication. So I run a communication course as well. Uh, one of the tip is that never tell patient or ask patient, or actually never ask patient that you grind your teeth because most of the time they will say no. Studies shows that it's more sort of a subconscious uh, process rather than a conscious process. Um, always tell patient that you grind your teeth and this is the reason, this is what's happening because you grind your teeth. If you want, you can ask them, are you aware of it? But they will usually say no. Um, the, the main other reason um, patient break their teeth because of the forces they apply. So our teeth are, the posterior teeth mainly, are built so then you apply forces more vertically. Whereas what happens is if you are doing para function, most of the forces are applied horizontally and that's or lateral forces and that's the very detrimental uh, forces because we are our teeth are designed and that's why if you see the mandibular teeth they are slightly inclined because that is how the muscles are working. Uh, your masseter muscles, and that's how the, 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 the upper teeth are inclined. And, and if you don't do that, what will happen is you are then restricting the, the whole masticatory muscle system. Um, again, the muscle, the blood supply, you get poor blood supply because of the isometric uh, activity. Um, neuromusculature uh, plays a, ha a heavy role because it's a sort of subconscious process. And also, you know, when you're chewing, you're going usually up and down, slightly side to side. But when patients doing parafunction, they're going, you know, all sorts of movements, um, which you cannot really replicate by even asking patients to do that. The only way to 
to replicate that or to have some understanding is looking at the faceting of the teeth and ask patient to try and grind it so that their teeth goes around that facet and moves or uh, passes by. And that's how you will be able to see how that teeth works when they're doing parafunction. So this is, um, there are two uh, sort of levers you need to understand. So this is classic, um, uh, we were discussing about the nutcracker. This is not, sorry, a this, the design is a nutcracker, but this is not how the classic nutcracker works. It works something like this, where you apply the, um, uh, P is power, uh, which is, uh, you know, you crushing it. W is where the work is happening and F is fulcrum. So if you imagine F is your PMJ, W is where the work is happening, where things are happening, and P is your muscle, which is applying the power. And if you look at the normal um, occlusion, where there's no destructive tendencies, you see this kind of uh, structure where your work, which is um, done, which, which involves eccentric movement, which is guiding everything, is done with the anterior teeth. And because it's done by anterior teeth, very, very less force is applied and can move the jaw really nicely. Whereas the loading is happening with the posterior teeth. And that works very well in the, in the structure because the closer you go to TMJ, more load you will get on the teeth. And more load you get on the teeth, you want those load to be vertical. You don't want to be eccentric or lateral because you have lateral forces, very heavy forces like this, where patients moving their jaw on left hand side and the right hand side there is a non-functional non-working uh, side contact and that turns the whole lever into class 2 lever which is more destructive and that's why the, those studies were saying you know you need to remove there are still quite a lot of studies uh, producing about the occlusal equilibration which means you remove all this non-working side contact um, I don't believe in that. Uh, I don't believe in equilibrating all the patients. You've got to look at their symptoms. However, if I'm doing a new restoration, I definitely don't want that in my new restoration because patient will, if you put the new restoration, if patient breaks it, it's then your responsibility. Um, and if patient's destroying their enamel, their teeth, um, you know, our restoration can be easily, I've seen zirconia breaking and fracturing. So, um, Sorry, they, they want. Devon, one second. Uh, there's, there's a gray uh, box appearing in the slide. Is, is that any way you can get, get remove those box? Um, are you able to see in yours? Because we are, we seems to be appearing, getting that. Oh yeah. yeah. Is it gone? Yeah, it's, see, uh, it's got smaller. It's got very small on the top. It was, it was the, your slide, I think, the, your faces and everything, which was uh, uh, lacking. That's perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. That's yes. Is that all right? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So um, thank you. So this is this is how the lever works. Um, any question? Because this this can get sometimes um, a bit tricky to understand. Shantil, do you have any questions there? Uh, th sorry. Uh, there is one question there from Rita. Should we take the restoration out of occlusion, like if you're making a crown zone three and there is canine guidance or crown zone premolus if there is a group function? Um, so should you, um, which tooth are you restoring? Sorry, so if she's restoring molar, uh, no, is it she's question that you take the molar off of occlusion or something? I think if you're making crown in three, this canine. canine, yes. If you make it crowns on three, there is a canine guidance. Mm -hmm. um, Rita, can you just redefine that question? We'll ask, Actually, we need a bit more clarity. I'm going to go through in a minute uh, in the webinar how to design the restorations uh, with the okay. guidance anyway. So I'll, I'll probably cover that. Jay, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, Devang, I had a question. Basically, you're talking about the principles of liver, uh, basically physics. My yes. question is, what is the amount of force, the range of force that we are looking at, which would be the breaking point for a tooth? 
uh, from where it is a functional tooth to where which is worrying for the tooth basically um that's a good question i haven't found any uh, study saying that the breaking point of tooth is definitely below 600 uh, which you know many times however it depends what angle the force is applied so even 300 um, pounds of force applied at an angle uh, can fracture the tooth so it depends which inclined plane uh, patients are contacting and how it's contacting um, the, the mandible, the molars, uh, there are some studies showing that the patient can really apply up to 1,100 pounds of um, forces in their parafunctional activities and they don't break teeth. Yeah. So it really depends on uh, what the tooth has. If it's a natural tooth, um, then it's, it's the angle and if you are doing the fulcrum uh, activity. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm being vague. But no, 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 I understand. No, no, I, I just wanted to see what was the range. So up to about 600 is okay then. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, so, so Emacs crowns are fine, you know, six, 700. Uh, as far as they do six, 700, it's, it's not a problem. As far as you maintain your occlusion. I mean, if you think about it, I, I do full mass reconstructions using, you know, composite resin. And they don't break because you're maintaining, you're managing occlusion really well. So if you, if you, manage the occlusion very well, then any restoration you do will have a longevity. Longevity, yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, Sorry. absolutely. Thanks a lot. Um, so occlusal assessment becomes really but important. Just yeah? before you go to the next slide, Adair, could you just quickly briefly go to the back slide? And one of them wants you to quickly go uh, explain it again, the, uh, the, the, the slide completely. Which liver, liver. Class one, class two, class three. So the class, uh, so first you need to understand class two, uh, which if you think about the nutcracker, so you know, if you, if you imagine P is your hand and you are, you're really applying force and cracking a nut. So that position becomes very, very efficient, right? So if you want to crack a nut, you're not going to grab it where the F is, where the fulcrum, grab it where the handle is, right? So, um, if you want to break something, that is the best mechanism. Now in the mouth, if you look at the left-hand side diagram, it replicates something like this when patients having non-working side contact, which means the force is applied by the masseter of the opposite side when you're having non-working side contact. So that can you just point it out with your mouse on exactly which side the masseter is being um, Can you see it? Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. So this is this is basically um, imagine this is your masseter muscle, um, and that's where the force is applied to here. Now this becomes your nut here, and that becomes a fulcrum. So if you apply that kind of a pressure, although obviously it's away from the fulcrum a little bit, but still it can break the tooth because you are still managed to apply a lot of pressure on there. Okay. Now. If you go uh, backwards here, now if, the, if you are holding your hand, if you're putting your fingers here and trying to crack that nut here, it will be almost impossible for you to do that. And that's how this works, because the fulcrum is here, your masseter muscle is applying pressure here, but the work is happening far away from that. And that's why you can you know, apply very less destructive forces anteriorly uh, if you apply force here. Uh, and that's why anterior teeth are good when it comes to uh, taking load in lateral forces because we know that the, the lateral forces or eccentric forces are more destructive than vertical forces. So if you want lateral forces to be applied to the tooth, you want to do that in for the anterior teeth. And study shows that you can do a 70% reduction if you use canine guidance in the force uh, compared to the molar, okay? So, so you reduce the 70% of the force. The more you go backwards, you, the force is getting slightly uh, heavier, but up to, as I said, premolar or molar, because you're distributing the force, it is fine if you're doing group function, but you won't use just a molar to intentionally to do uh, a lateral uh, excursion. 
uh, although patient might have that in their natural dentition, and if they do, and it's a natural tooth, I would leave it. You know, I wouldn't worry about uh, that too much, unless there are certain situations which, which I will go through. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. So, um, how would you know all this? You know, um, so I'll give you just five things you need to assess because I don't want to make things too complicated. I want to keep this very simple. So first you need to check patient's ICP. So make sure that patient has a stable occlusion. So, you know, uh, when patient's closing, um, you know, they can close in one bite uh, again and again. Okay, you check patient's slide from CEO to ICP. Now this takes a, a little bit of practice. Um, when I say a little bit, um, I say a lot. Um, and the, the best, patients to start this practicing is anyone who has a permanent dentition and young. So, you know, anyone above 16 and over. Um, between 16 to 24 is good because they have less stress levels. Um, their jaw is still, the muscles are still flexible and you will be able to guide them back to CR uh, and then find CO very easily. Um, so if you're going to practice, don't start practicing in someone who comes with a very worn down teeth and, you know, they sit in your chair and then you think, oh, I need to, I need to do this cram, I need to start uh, finding their CO. Try and practice as much as possible. Um, lateral guidance, check their lateral guidance when they're guiding laterally or protrusive guidance, um, which teeth are contacting. Just make note of that and have a look at it in six months, whether it's changed or not or more importantly, whether you're treating any of them, or any of them has a heavy, heavily filled teeth. Because if they do, you need to really tell patient that this is, you know, this can happen. Now always leave things open. I tell patient that, look, this can fracture, this may or may not fracture. And I tell them that, look, it's, it's been shown that more likely it will fracture. I don't, just don't know when, it may be six months, six years, you know, 60 years, who knows. Um, but if when it fractures, it can fracture catastrophically. Um, and that's why I would advise you to treat this sooner than leave it as it is. But if you leave it and patient says, yeah, no, leave it. And if that tooth breaks, then you are basically an astronomer. <laughs> you predict future. So uh, by telling patient, at least educating them, you gain some respect from them. Um, check non-working side contacts. Again, you don't need to do much about it. Uh, unless it's heavily filled or you are restoring it. If you're restoring it, just get rid of them. You don't want non-working side contact in your restoration, which may mean that your cusp, little cusp might be slightly flatter, but that's fine because you don't want um, that kind of dis destroying forces class, uh, you know, two lever forces applying on your restoration. So if you do these five things in your general dental practice, you will have higher predictability and more success rate, and you will be able to diagnose many more things. Um, so what warning signs do you see? Uh, you know, when you see a patient, or what warning signs, when I say, you know, you need to really step back and think, okay, I need more knowledge than just a general dental practitioner needs, um, because, you know, you see patients who, you ask them to bike together, and they cannot really close in that one position, now, this is different with the edentulous cases, so that's because they just not their you know guidance. Um, edentulous patients are many times it's easier to um, guide once they have teeth. That's why you find that when on your final fit of the denture, um, you know you've done everything fine, but the final fit or even trying stage, you know they just you they find a different different bite from their pocket or something. So um, you need to really assess. Um, whether their muscles are fine and they manage to close in one bite. We're talking about dentition cases right here. So, so if the patient cannot close their teeth in one bite, then you need to really stop and think whether you want to treat this patient or first give them a splint and make, make their muscle relaxed first or deprogramming, as you call it. But you see patients with the multiple uh, broken teeth where you know, as I said, again, patient comes to you and breaks one tooth, another tooth, and just keeps going on. Patient complains of pain near jaw joint or in, in their muscles. 
any of those patients, I would personally advise you not to treat it. You can treat it, but treat that symptom of pain first. So just temporize the teeth and then make sure you get rid of the jaw pain and, and muscle. That could be simply giving a machine splint, and which you can do in general dental practice, you know, um, not under national health privately. And the way I explain to patient is I tell them that you, know, you need at least four to five appointments. The fabrication and the cost of splint is much higher than what we get paid. So under national health, we get the standard um, basic uh, bite raising appliance. However, if you want much more advanced appliance, uh, then you need this. Uh, you can also tell that I've been trained uh, specifically in this. Uh, if you have been trained, then uh, you can tell that as well. As far as I'm aware, um, you need to be able to justify why you're offering privately um, due to cost or there's um, you're still offering similar treatment uh, under national health. You can offer that in privately because doing Michigan Splint under National Health does not make sense because it will be very expensive. You'll be paying from your pocket. So something like that, cases like that, when a patient comes, you know, they have multiple fractured teeth, quite a lot of wear, and, you know, you, you know all, almost all teeth are restored. And when you see these type of cases, you need to really step back and think whether you want to, the, the, this patient came to me with a uh, fractured um, cusp on the premolar. Now you can guess which premolar it was. Uh, but, but you know, it's patient wasn't aware of it, that he has this issue, no one told him. Um, and he was a regular visitor to dentist six monthly. Now, when patient says no one told him, it doesn't mean that no one told him, you know, he just probably doesn't remember um, that the dentist probably told them that you know you have a bear or the dentist didn't put much emphasis on it. So when you see these cases, you need to really look because this is the, almost every single teeth needs the restoration apart from the posterior teeth. Sorry about the photos. I'm not sure why it's coming up blurry. Um, but it needs the restoration. So when you see these kind of cases, you really need to stop and think whether it needs a full mouth reconstruction. However, today we are going to discuss about informative approach in routine dentistry and how you can apply the principles um, in doing routine dentistry. So any questions until now? Yeah, or Sanford. Um You can care. It's, it's all good so far, uh, Deva. So let's discuss about a few uh, things, how you can manage some of the cases which you see in your routine dentistry. So where can you apply knowledge of occlusion? in your general day-to-day -day practice. So you can do, when you're doing single or multiple direct or indirect restorations, you can, it's, it's helpful. And I'll go through with how to assess occlusion of single direct restoration in a minute and how to assess occlusion of the teeth you are using for guiding, guidance. Um, fabrication of splints, this is really, really good uh, for you to learn because if you can't do anything, at least give patient a splint and that will reduce a lot of uh, damage. Although it will not stop the progress, which you really need to mention it to patient because when they remove this enamel layer and they have exposure of dentine, that dentine will even wear with normal acidic food. So when they're eating, the acid will erode den uh, dentine. However, by giving them splint, you will make sure that you know, you're reducing this parafunctional um, forces which they're applying at night time. Um, you will help, learning about the splint will help in treating common uh, TMD issues, um, mainly Michigan splints again. Uh, it is very, very helpful. You can give patient uh, anterior positioning appliance, and these are the only two appliances you need to know about uh, when it comes to TMD issues. If you can't treat patients with these two, then it's a basically a specialist referral case. Regular assessment, if you do the assessment, additional assessment, which I've told you already, then what you will do is you, you'll be finding more slides. And when you find these slides, you will be able to assess which slide has more horizontal component. If patients is moving their jaw forward a lot when they are sliding, um, more than two millimeter, that 
is um, uh, a warning sign. So you need to make sure you really stop and you need to mount the model in CO and then remove that uh, tooth away and then see where the occlusion lands. And then you will be able to plan the treatment. And many times those patients need orthodontic treatment if you want to treat it correctly. Or single, uh, simple implant um, restorations, you know, it could be a bridge, it could be a simple uh, implant restoration. And the way you design occlusion in uh, implant restoration is slightly different um, than you do in your natural uh, normal dentition. Um, so let's see how, let's say patients come and sitting in your chair, you're doing a posterior tooth occlusal restoration. So I'm just going to go through some steps as to how you can assess their occlusion by, you, I'm assuming that you have done all those five checks, which I've told you before uh, about the occlusal assessment, but what would, be a, uh, what would be a protocol if I'm restoring someone's teeth as a single tooth posteriorly? So first I would check patient's um, context, teeth of the context. So when patient comes and sits in the chair, their jaw is more relaxed. Um, when patients, their mouth is open for a long time, their muscles start getting stressed and tensed. And the bite which they give you after you have done multiple restoration uh, many times is slightly different sometimes because they are tired. Um, so first you need to check the baseline occlusion. The way I do that is I would assess um, shim stock holes. So I hope everyone has a shim stock in their general dental practice because it's a very important tool. Um, check the shim stock hole of adjacent teeth and a couple of teeth on the opposite side. Because sometimes you can bite, if patient bites hard enough, they can get really good contact on the same side, but then get the open contact on the other side. So you need to have some uh, contralateral guide, uh, guidance as well. So you need a couple of teeth, shim stocks, whichever it holds, make a note of that. And then pick up your articulating foil, um, not a paper. Paper is more thicker than the foil. Foil is basically, they have a, almost like a shim stock or aluminum foil um, with the one-sided coating. So it looks almost like a paper. Um, and you can use that, uh, some of Prestige does, uh, some of them a really good one. Um, but they do a thick one as well. So just make sure it's around 14 micron thick. You don't get 40 micron thick, uh, because that's just pointless. Um, so make sure you, you have a thin articulating paper, then check the contacts of the teeth. Um, for posterior teeth, if you're not planning any guidance, then just uh, check the one articulating paper, check occlusal context. You do need to check the guidance because you need to see whether the guidance is steep. If the guidance is steep and the posterior is discluding really easily, you can build really nice anatomy, make it look really beautiful. But if it's a flatter guidance, then you need to build almost flatter anatomy. The way you would know that is near the adjacent teeth if they're not filled. If they are flat, worn down, and if you're doing conformity approach, unfortunately, that means you're conforming to what they have. So, you know, and to be honest, if you have a flat teeth on either side, there's no point in doing really nice anatomy in the middle of the tooth. That probably patient needs a full muscle construction. But adjacent teeth, I learn a lot about doing that because once you put a rubber dam on, you can build really high and you lose a perspective. So I look at the adjacent teeth, look at their anatomy when the patient's guiding, look at my reference points, and then visualize my end shape before I would started doing anything. Because again, when you start picking up the drill, looking at everything, nowadays you will have rubber dam anyway. Um, so you can't really check occlusion after you remove the decay. Um, but even if you don't using rubber dam, you need to have this assessment done before patient's jaw is um, tired. So look at the morphology of adjacent teeth. Now, once the rubber dam's on, my adjacent teeth are my really guides. They're helping me where I'm putting my restorations, where it will be my marginal ridges, how high they will be, where will be my cusps, because I've already assessed when I'm doing lateral guidance, asking patient to move laterally, I'm checking the guidance and I'm already assessed compared 
compared to my chest and teeth, how much is the guidance and where it's stopping. Um, if you want to have a nicer anatomy and you have a flatter guidance, then keep the fissures a bit deeper. And that means you won't get a very flat anatomy. Um, after you've done the occlusion, after you've done the restoration, first um, check the occlusion or bite visually because sometimes it's really high and you know you, you will be able to reduce it very quickly down. But hopefully when you follow the upper, uh, when we discuss the top points, you won't have that kind of scenario where it's way off. Um, then I would use a shim stock hold first on the tooth which I'm restoring and the either side of the teeth. If the tooth I'm restoring, shim stock's not holding, which is eight micron thick. And the tooth on either side, shim stock is holding, which means the tooth which I have built is not in occlusion. So unfortunately, you need to rebuild it a little bit more because you want the tooth in occlusion where the it's um, just ICP or it's guiding. You want some sort of a contact. You can't, you, I wouldn't advise you to leave teeth out of contact because what then will happen is you will get some sort of supra eruption which is out of your control. So either the lower tooth will supra erupt or the upper tooth will supra erupt or you lose that loading mechanism and your either side of the teeth may end up taking more load and they might start fracturing because you know, you're not distributing the load evenly. It doesn't happen with one tooth and that's why many times we get away with just making them, you know, I used to do that at university. I was taught like that, you know, just use a blue articulating paper, grind, grind, grind until you don't see any blue, okay? But that's not how uh, ideally you should do it. The way to do it, even you put shim stock, you should hold all three teeth and checking contact, you should have ICP, intercostal contact in all the teeth, including your tooth which you restored. And then you decide um, that uh, whether the tooth, if you want that tooth to be guiding tooth or not. So let's assume we are doing a canine. So first I need to decide whether, you know, if I want to build protrusive or lateral or both guidance into that tooth. Now, when would I not use canine? I would prefer to use canine even if I'm doing crown on that tooth um, because I'm hoping that the, re, the, the crown would be good enough to, to um, get the load. However, if the canine has post and core, <clears throat> I prefer not to use that tooth for a guidance. So any post and core teeth, I prefer just ICP contact. So you would treat it like the previous scenario. Um, so you're not building any guidance, but you need to be aware of that because then you need to see your premolars. So if you lose canine, the premolar is not guiding, now your molar is guiding. That is not a good situation. So what you need to then do is build your premolars so then they guide and hoping that they are, um, um, they are um, not unrestored or you can build them. Or if you're restoring them, then even better. If all of them has post and core, then it's very difficult. In that case, you then have to go with the groove function where you, you are managing guidance on all the teeth uh, and keeping it light. So just to go back again, so first you decide whether you are doing using guidance on that tooth or not. Visualize the path of guidance. If you're building that tooth directly, then maybe slightly over build. And then when patient's guiding, you can decide how shallow you want that guidance to be. If you are doing indirect restoration, then and let's say if I'm doing canine, it's a good tooth you know, for a crown um, and it can take the load and I'm doing indirect restoration. So if I'm doing that, then I would prefer to mount the models on semi-gestical articulator so the technician can replicate the guidance really well. What I want technician to do is, when the tooth is not there, the crown, I want to see where the guidance is landing. Because what you need to do is you need to have some um, strategy in place where in future, because you are doing porcine crown and the lower tooth is a natural crown, and a natural tooth, it will wear at some point. And because of that, 
eventually patient will start picking up contact posteriorly. And when that happens, you want uh, strategically which teeth contacting. So you want ideally premolars and then the molar. That means again, maybe building up a tooth, premolars or molar. Not in guidance right now, but as a strategy for the future. Um, certainly you need to know if the canine is not there, where the guidance is going for planning purposes. For um, anterior teeth, one extra step you need to do is once you've done all the check of occlusion, you need to ask patients to sit up because usually we are lying, we are checking everything and patients are lying down. Um, but for many studies shows that when patients sit up, they have a postural uh, movement of their jaw and the jaw moves forward. That's how the muscle works. And um, this can restrict into their functional uh, movement um, or envelope of function, as you call it. And because of that, you can start getting fractures in the anterior veneers, debonding, chipping of the uh, fillings. Uh, so what you need to do is make patients sit upright and check the occlusion and adjust it a tiny bit. You usually don't need too much adjustment. Um, and that's why you many times see when you know you check the occlusion, patients that sits up and you know you deglove everything, you know, take your uh, ever, you know handpiece off. Nurses have already started clearing up, and patients like, oh, uh, it feels a little bit proud. And I've just asked you, but that's because patients um, is sitting up and their muscles is uh, different. Now, if it's very minor when you assess it and you really don't want to take it out, okay, patient may get used to that. But if you have an ability to take it out with, by maintaining contact, then it's best to do that. So this is um, a case which I showed you before, where you know the patients um, chipped um, um, cusp, one of the you know, angle um, of the upper right one. And now if you look at the occlusion carefully, hopefully now you'll be able to point out when Hopefully, when patients protruding, if you look at it, the upper right two is, is um, intruded. So the guidance here is going to be quite shallow. But guidance here, hopefully, will be much better. Because these teeth are overlapped and the patient had a chip because of the trauma, I'm not really worried building up this tooth. Okay, and that's, you can build it up the way you want. I'm not really concerned into having guidance on my bonded fillings or restoration. I'm happy to incorporate that as far as it's, uh, um, both of it's distributed. So I'm not going to have guidance, protrusive guidance just by one central. I would be happy if I can distribute with the other centrals, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay to, uh, you know, I don't want to take it off the guidance. The more the teeth, the better. So, so this is what you can do. In this case, I did the restoration because the tooth actually wasn't in contact with guiding. She was guiding protrusive guidance with um, premolar, a little bit premolar contact, so which was healthy. So I didn't do anything about it. Um, where the case like this, this patient wanted uh, upper left two. This restoration here changed because um, her reading's coming up and she didn't like the appearance of that. So while I'm doing this, she said that it was chipped at the back, I think, um, again, due to trauma. But you can look at this lateral incisor and lateral incisors are, are some of, sometimes the worst because they sometimes overlap canine. And when patients anteriorly regarding this edge of that lateral incisor that can chip that tooth. And that's, that could be, you know, you're doing filling after filling after filling, and you keep chipping that. Um, and that's when patient comes to you, that one filling lasted for 20 years, now you've done a new one, and it broke. I'm assuming that your bonding technique is really good and you're doing all the necessary steps and you're you know, really good at bonding, and it's still debonding, then you need to, you know, it could be that the occlusion is the, the, the factor. In her case, again, I build occlusion um, in, um, in, in the guidance, so then we don't have to worry about that. And it's been six years and it's doing really well. Now, this case, 
as we discussed before, came to me because she kept upper left too, and the patient literally uh, lost faith in that dentist because the dentist did a lot of things and keep breaking, and you know, they didn't know, know what to do else. Um, however, he was booked in to um, have another post and core crown put in, but that too has vertical fracture. Um, so let's look at this uh, sort of case carefully. And if you look at the canine, I hope you can see that there is a huge gap here between these two canines. And what that means is the lateral, the central had a little bit guidance when patient was guiding towards patient's left, um, but the lateral was another guiding force because this canine tip was guiding through that area. And that's why canine was, uh, the, the lateral incisors were breaking. Now, interestingly, the cervical abrasion is much worse on that side than the other side. Obviously, patient has got some you know, demineralization going on, so it's not the only reason. But it could be that um, you know it's a, it's a detrimental effect of that, or it's just a, a simple breakage. It's difficult to tell. This patient already has a cervical filling in there. So this case, if it comes to you, um, and if you don't know why it's breaking, you might repeat the same mistakes again. So let's go back and look at the occlusal surface. And you understand why this is happening because this canine is rotated. And that's why it's not really helping uh, what it should be doing. It's not doing what it should be doing. But this canine is rotated, but it's not as bad. And because of that, lateral is taking all the load. If you look at the, the premolar, it's also taking load. You can see here the faceting there. Uh, and you can see a tiny bit faceting there. So this is right at the end taking probably a load. So in these kind of cases, I would change the occlusion by additive technique. And that's something you can do in general dental practice. Uh, there's no reason why you cannot do this. Um, you can do two ways. You can you know, build up the teeth freehand. And I'll show you which teeth need to build up and how. But what you can do is, which is my preferred technique, is um, get the, the mounted model. And build them up. So when I say build up, what I'm do, uh, doing is I'm trying to change the guidance to primarily canine guidance because the, the, his canines were good, healthy. So before we go to that route, we need to understand why you want canine guidance. Um, so first of all, uh, we know that the, the favorable crown root ratios, maxillary canine are really long and you know good teeth um, they, they do last in the mouth for a very long time because they have long teeth they have more pdl and that means more proprioception that means when patients guiding they will be able to tell the load that it's high load or the uh, reduced load um, palatal surfaces of upper canine is concave and that helps in giving this um, progressive guidance um, in, a, in a lateral movement. You have um, mechanically favorable position, as we discussed, you know, more towards um, class three type of situation where you 70% reduction in forces than if you consider second molar or the first molar. It's easy to, um, so, so with regards to the, Canine guidance, this was just why you choose canine as a guidance. But if you're choosing canine guidance, there are many um, studies shows that it reduces the muscle activity. And it shows that during lateral movement, the occlusal forces are more evenly distributed by canine guidance in the muscles. And however, there are studies which shows otherwise as well. So I could give you two more studies which shows that it doesn't make any difference, which is fine. So, you know, this is all theoretical. Why I do it? Because it's very easy. You know, it's easy to deal with it. It's easier to deal with one tooth than three teeth simultaneously. Also, when you, you can incorporate in your restorative technique very easy. So for this tooth, 
we did I did a mounting I do for minor correction I do my own mounting and um, max ups and that's what I teach and this is mounting in uh, patients CR and you can see the the distance is quite quite a lot um, in CR so then I changed the mounting in uh, ICP because I didn't want to change I just I do two mountings many times just to assess because I'm curious uh, what is their CR looks like. Um, but if I would have reduced that patient's tooth, which had a first point of contact, the CO, I might be end up in this situation. And that means that a bit more buildup in the canine. So what I was coming to is I do my own wax ups and this is what I teach in my courses because um, not for full mouth reconstruction. I mean, I can do full mouth reconstruction as well, but for mainly these kind of smaller cases where you're not really doing too much, but you want that precision control. And this is what we end up with. It doesn't look great because it's articulating papers, but it's for you to show, see that if you look at the canine of the left hand side, it's guiding lateral and protrusive. The reason being is that this tooth had a post, which we eventually took it out. This was, I, I built it up uh, for just a temporization while we are doing everything. Um, this tooth was the only good tooth, and then this tooth, another post. So I didn't want really anterior guidance into these two teeth, a uh, protrusive guidance. Um, and this tooth, I wanted to keep it minimum because the tooth was uh, quite heavily filled. Um, on the left side, however, I have a canine guidance and a lateral incisor when the patient moves la uh, laterally. And um, I have both, because you can see just about two lines there, I have both uh, guidance for patient moving anteriorly. So I'm distributing it. Now you might say, why well, I didn't go down to posterior, in, you know, involve the premolars as well. I just didn't want to make things very complicated, simple as that. Um, and then obviously we replicate that in, in just a mock-up and then finish it up. We, as I said, ended up taking that tooth out at the moment, denture, and then replace it with implants. So here, just a change of restoration. And that's the, the finished step. And you can see the bite is much better. And the way you do this, going back, if you're doing freehand, and this is, if you're not sending it to technician to do it, even if you're sending it to technician, you really need to tell technician that you want the buildup from ICP onwards. So they need to check where the ICP contact is and start putting wax above incisely to that contact, not typically, otherwise you'll end up increasing that OVD. So what I did was, if you look at here, that's where patient was contacting there and there. And I build the guidance um, about that. So I build the composition. So you could do this freehand uh, by just ass assessing, estimating gap, and then do one tooth at a time and get the guidance right, and then do the other two, other tooth, and do the other tooth. And that will help you doing it, just will take a little bit longer because this one I had an index. I just used the index and it was a quicker job. It was a longer, it was more time outside patient's mouth which is, to be honest, more favorable in these current circumstances, then when you see patient, you want to get things moving very quickly. So this is what you can, I feel, do in general practice. And this is very underutilized tool, which people use to change patient's guidance. Now, I would only do this if you have a virgin tooth. If you have a restored crown, and putting so much heavy load on one tooth is not great. So then you need to distribute the, the load. Um, it's finished. And then just to end a couple of slides, why, uh, again, coming back to a knowledge of occlusion is important, is that when you're doing the cases in blue, which is simple, after you assess and you know that it's simple, uh, you can do those cases more predictably. However, what um, I tend to the way I learn is I want to expand my envelope of function, my personal envelope of function, which means I want to expand my skills. 
So the next step, what you need to look into if you're not doing it already, is try and treat moderately difficult cases, which means uh, treating patients with multiple quadrants um, without doing um, reorganized approach. I mean, you could, moderately difficult cases can come under reorganized approach, um, and there's no reason a general dental practitioner cannot do full mouth reconstructions with appropriate knowledge and training. And leave the extremely difficult cases because they are not really money-making cases. So, you know, but if you're interested and if you are, you know, uh, you know, crazy like me, and if you want to do it, feel free to do it. It's, uh, don't do it for money. It's, it's really um, thrilling when um, some dentists cannot treat the patient and patients come to you and you treat them and the you know, patient's grateful and just gives you that boosted energy um, to treat them and make them happy. So ultimately, what I say when I say of moderately treating cases, you should be able to, by understanding occlusion, be able to do cases like this, which are reorganized cases, um, but you should be able to do these type of cases. And it's, it's not that difficult. Many times reorganizing is easier than organizing or conformity because you're limited. When you reorganize, you are, you are free to do a lot of treatment. So that's me. Um, if you have any questions, if I haven't been able to answer them, I will try my, my best to answer all the questions, but if you come up with any answers later on, questions, feel free to uh, email me uh, at info at drdevanpatel.com. I have a Facebook page where um, I'm going to start um, discussing all the cases and all the techniques. Um, so you can join that or like it on occlusion to or rehabilitation or follow me on Instagram. Um, and that's me, done. Any questions? Hi Devang, thanks a lot. It was a wonderful uh, lecture as usual. Uh, um, we got one question from one of our uh, delegates. Uh, what they're asking is, uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, Michigan splints? Is it part of this? Could, could you give us something? Um, yeah, I mean, no, the Michigan splint is, I do sort of two days full hands-on course on that because it's very difficult to learn Michigan splints without doing hands-on. But sure. um, what um, you need to do is you need to first, even if you want to learn that, first learn to, patient, to put patient into a centric relation because that's the key. That's something you cannot learn by doing just two days hands-on. That's something you need to keep practicing. If you have practiced that already, then all you need to do is capture that bite. So keep the patient somehow in um, CR using Lucia jig and uh, capture that bite, take upper and lower impressions, face go, send all that to technician, and they can give you, um, a, they can make a Michigan splint. The only thing is that that's not it. When patient comes in, you need to fit the Michigan splint, and then you need to adjust the splint to patient's occlusion. And then you need to review it every weekly until the occlusion is not changed, because when patient relaxes, that jaw moves backwards into more relaxed position. So the contact keeps changing. So you need to keep adjusting. Um, so it's, it's not really to take the impressions, take the bite records, send it to technician, and you get the Michigan split, give it to patient, and off you go. It's, it, it takes a lot of, and that's why I said there's no point in doing under national health because it's just the time you take doesn't remunerate you. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so for Michigan split, all you need is um, initially get the patient in CR, get the bite registration in CR using Alicia Jig or some sort of a deprogrammer, baseball record. So these are the three things technician will need. Uh, you need to tell technician that make sure that you want canine guidance and shallow anterior guidance because you don't want to have a, a steep anterior guidance in your Michigan splint if you have a because then it will be restrictive and patient will feel like a closed lock jaw and that's what technician does a lot creates a really steep anterior guidance because then it discludes so easily so they don't need to worry about making the splint really well at the back so you need to make sure that you tell them the shallow uh, anterior guidance um, I use S4S lab. 
I don't have any affiliation with them, but I use them and uh, they, they are they are fine. Sometimes it's temperamental depending who has made it. So I send it back, but most of the time they, 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 they get it right. If you get the Michigan splint where you really see indentation of the opposing teeth, that means what they have done is literally they have squashed the, the wax, they closed the joint, squashed the wax and just processed it. You don't touch that splint, send it back and just get them remade because you want the occlusal splint with a flat surface where you have point contact on uh, of the lower teeth on the um, splint and guidance, as I said, using canines and protrusive guidance using just probably two teeth. Okay. I hope that helps. I mean, it's a... Um, as I said, it's, a, it's a quite um, tricky to explain theoretically. Yeah, per perfect. I think, guys, uh, it's, it's, we are way beyond time, and some of the guys uh, have their own, and, and then Dave has his own evening booked up for himself as well. That was an amazing overall view about occlusion. Uh, Dave, uh, we, are, we are so grateful okay. for you about that. Uh, so, what uh, Dave has also said is given you an insight about how we can. Uh, get yourself trained about occlusion with the courses that he does. This brings us to the point again about how we were discussing what is uh, patient need kind of dentistry to what is patient want kind of dentistry that we spoke about in the morning, which I want to reiterate at this point. And we are all trying to work out a way to improvise our skills. This is not something that we can just see a YouTube video or just sort of uh, discuss with other colleagues and start doing, I think we would need much more than that and probably uh, more active learning. And, and with active learning, what dental groups have basically done is started to carry on uh, producing certain programs which helps uh, people with hands-on mental aid training. And that is what uh, they was trying to explain to us as well, that there has to be some level of mentoring, there has to be a level of hand holding. So we are comfortable slowly implementing it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so what we have done, because there was so much of uh, inquiries of what training uh, uh, people are gonna start looking into. So certificate in dental implantology for 2021. This is the course we have launched. Uh, it's an eight-month-long course starting in February 2021, spread out over eight days. Occlusion is one of the topics uh, along with all the other skill sets, including surgery, including restoration, and also marketing because we find sometimes we are very good clinicians, but we don't know how to explain and market it for ourselves. So at Dental Roots, we always feel marketing is also a skill that we should consistently have to explain our patients in a way that they can understand. And that is why we have seven practical sessions, which does include live surgeries and performing implant placements and restorations under complete supervision. So no matter where you guys are, because we know a lot of our members are general dental practitioners who have just started practicing, and there are some people who only want to do restorations and not surgeries, we have have taken all of that into consideration to structure our course in a way that you fit in there. What is your investment? Uh, at the minute, the early bird investment is just 4,995. All you need to do is go into the website uh, and, and it's just 195 pounds that you got to pay to reserve your place. It's only 15 delegates we are taking. So it's a proper intense one-to-one -one training we are giving and it's not like you're not looked after. You are looked after at every stage. Return on investment, you improve varied skill sets post-COVID, which is very important. I think every speaker I've been listening to all this while says just one thing. After COVID, guys, you're gonna do slow dentistry, you're gonna do precise dentistry, you're gonna spend more time with your patients, and so we need to have a better skill set and we need to learn things hands-on to be better. The website address is here. Let's all move from uh, being a need dentistry provider to be a want dentistry provider. Saying that, I thank Dave so much for taking out his time on his weekend and a busy schedule. And he's explained such a, such a sort of a 
intense topic in the best possible way so that we could understand something. I think we still need to understand a lot and probably got to go back to Dave uh, for a detailed course on that basis. Uh, I thank uh, Jay to have been moderating and taking on questions from every end. Some of the questions we have not been able to answer today, please guys email it across to us. We'll get those answered. And also your feedbacks has been amazing. Uh, all the courses that we are running is on the basis of what feedbacks you are giving. So please let that feedback come to us and we are gonna make sure we come up with wonderful speakers like Dave today and uh, Jonathan in the morning. So we have some interesting sessions as we go forward. So from me, thank you everybody. And this is a small video to end the note for today saying what is expected from dental groups as you go into some hands-on training. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Devon. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.